Welcome to The Cut, a Redeemer podcast. We're not everything makes a Sunday sermon. That doesn't mean it isn't worth talking about. So we've created space to dive deeper into topics and to talk about some of the good stuff that just didn't quite make The Cut. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to The Cut. My name is Jeff Martin. I'm the lead pastor here at Redeemer Community Community Community, blah, 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 community <laughs> Church. We're winging this. Um, and I'm joined by my awesome co-host. Leah Martinez and our special guest today. Yeah, and so for those of you that don't know, Carter is always behind the camera. and um, But he does way more than just produce things. He's always adding... Um, insight, wisdom into the conversations before Leah and I get to sit down and talk. And so we thought, man, what if he just hopped on and joined us for this episode? And um, so you can see who's behind so much of what happens at Redeemer. So yeah, welcome. and both of these guys just got a haircut in the last like 24 hours. So I'm deaf. You guys didn't give me the memo. Well, I, de- I definitely got a haircut because we were recording today. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, mine is more for... Out. Like, I don't buy a new shirt for Easter, but I'll get a haircut. Okay. All so, right. Well. Yeah. Well, today, um, you know, this this whole series, we've, we've gone into some weighty topics. And today we're going to go into pain and suffering. And so we did, we asked people to write down questions and... Um, and there were some themes that came up and you so graciously divided them up into themes when you handed them to me. But there was a lot of themes around pain and suffering and talking to people at Redeemer about what it is that they felt or that they've gone through with pain and suffering um, more than I realized is um, infertility. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of young moms would are struggling with, with that. Um, you have things that really hit personal with parents where there where a parent that someone was really close to passed away from something like cancer or a disease or um, a tra- tragic event. But um what are some of the things you guys just from people when we get down into the ground of, of our church, not just hypothetical situations, but people that you know, what are some of those things that people people are wrestling with around our community that would that would lump into that category of, of pain and suffering? Um well Carter and I were speak we're talking earlier and I think like we kind of came to the thing of like reframing the question instead of saying like why am I in pain and why am I suffering? Reframing it. You're the one that said it, Carter, so I'll let you. Um, So, you know, a lot of times, like, maybe some of the language that we use around pain and suffering, um, it can kind of give the impression that maybe God is causing our suffering or that he's the author of of our pain and suffering. But we know that he's not because we know that that's not in the character of God because he is good and he is love. So I think um, maybe if we reframe the question and we instead uh, frame it like, how is God using our pain and our suffering? Because we know that because he is a good God, that he can take the things that are messy and that are awful, and he can use them to turn about a good thing for us, to shape us more into the likeness of Christ. And of course, you know, if there, if there was a way for him to do it, without pain and suffering, he absolutely would. And he does. Yeah. But sometimes he uses our circumstances to work something better. Yeah. And I would, I would, um, we were talking about, yeah, God's not the author of pain and suffering. Right. But when sin enters the world, right. And brokenness happens and people have free will. If someone decides I'm going to get drunk and get in my car and they kill someone, God did not, he was the not the author of that, right? But then what does he do with it? And we can see all throughout the Bible, all of the things that he does with people who are suffering. And we also can look at ourselves, right? Like, I would never, when I'm suffering, think, oh, I'm so thankful that I'm going through this suffering. I'm so glad. But we know like suffering produces endurance and that endurance produces character and character produces hope. 
and we will never be ashamed of the hope that we have in Christ. And so on the other side of suffering, and we see how God has shaped us and made us and refined us, we see that, man, he is redeeming and renewing even in this broken world. Um, that, yeah. that doesn't really answer your question. No, but um, <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to get my head around what are some of the things that people are dealing with, just so people listening in can be like, I'm not the only one. Um, so that's what I thought about a couple, but yeah, let's just shift topics. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, so something that got cut from the sermon that is somewhat in line with what, what you guys are saying is um, – I think I remember when I when I was understanding how does the gospel truth apply to hard times in life, and so that would include times when you're like, God, why are you allowing this to happen? And I think there's this false thinking that's exposed in the Book of Job, specifically with his first group of friends, where they're like, you must have done something wrong, and God's punishing you. And so when you think about the gospel, well, Jesus, he he paid for all of our sin. Like all of our sin has been nailed to the cross. Um, we're fully and forever forgiven because of the work that he's done. And so if Jesus took the punishment we deserved upon himself on the cross, and that means the payment of our sin past, present and future has been fully paid for. And so therefore, if God was to punish us now for sin that was already paid for at the cross, he would be double punishing, um, which wouldn't be just, it wouldn't be fair so God, in his character, can't take double payment for something and still be true to his character. Therefore, when you're going through something, it's not God punishing you. Um, and so I think to realize, like, okay, I'm going through this, but it's not God somehow punishing me for my sin. And so if it's not punishment, then what is it? Well, it very well could be formative. And so I think for me, realizing I'm going through something, God's not punishing me. But how is he using this to shape me? And so the the question for me shifted from God, get me out of this, which is kind of my first response. Like I need to escape, get me out of this and realizing that sometimes God does bring us out. Sometimes he brings us around, but most, most of the time he shapes us by bringing us through mm -hmm. to shape my question. Okay, God, help me to have the wisdom to see what you're doing in this or through this. And um, not an easy question to ask, not a fun response, but to say, okay, God, I don't believe you're punishing me because I believe that's been carried to the cross. However, I, I, I want to know wisdom. I want to know your heart. Like help me to see what you're doing in me and what you're doing through this to shape me to be more like Jesus. And, and sometimes I feel like God gives some clarity to that. And other times I'm like, got nothing. And, uh, and right. that's where I'll maybe find out in eternity. Right. So. Yeah. I don't think the goal is to figure out the why, like, I was telling Carter earlier this morning, um, I went to a, um, a foot washing service last night because it's Holy Week. Um, and in the homily, um, the person speaking said, the disciples have all these questions for Jesus about what's happening, what's going to happen next. We don't understand. And Jesus's response is not answers to their questions, but instead of a tangible act of love of washing their feet. And so I think when we are going through those things, it is like, oh, I want an answer. I want to know why, but instead, and this is where we follow Christ through his suffering is that I don't know why, but this is part of the Christian life is to die to things trusting that new life is going to come like that's the that's the beautiful thing about the resurrection right it's like christ is the firstborn of all of new creation and we get to follow him into that but what comes before resurrection death death comes before that and so the only thing that we can do is just trust you are going to bring new life out of this in some form or fashion i don't know how i may not moses died in the wilderness right like he's like touted as the greatest leader in all of Israel, the greatest prophet. And he dies in the in the wilderness. He doesn't get to go to the promised land. And so we may not see the promised land, but we just have to trust that it's gonna it's gonna happen. Like he trusts like the people are gonna get there because God is the, their leader. I'm I'm just the person in charge right now. But some they're gonna get there. Yeah. No, as you said that, I was reminded of how many of the hearers of our faith have that experience of never having their why questions answered. Yeah. When you think about Moses, 
he gets a picture of the promised land from across the river and God's like, and you've got to die. Um, someone else is going to carry that mantle. Think about Jeremiah. Who's like, God, you deceive me. Like he talked about conquering nations, building up kingdoms and and I'm in a pit. Like this is not going like I expected. And I mean, he feels let down. You think about John the Baptist. Yep. Like, are you the one? Should I expect another? I mean, think about how Mary must have felt. I mean, at the cross with her son. Yep. Like, I mean, God, like you showed up and said this was the Messiah. And and like, what's ha- like, I yep. like so many here, like not just obscure people in the Bible, right. but heroes of our faith. Abraham has promised that he's going to be the father of many generations. He yeah. doesn't get to see that happen. He just has to trust that that promise is going to be fulfilled. Yeah. And I think about as you, as you're talking about just part of the Christian journey, as we're doing the read, th- read through the new Testament together. Um, some of the letters that we've gone through already have whole sections about expecting suffering as part of the Christian journey. And it's like, ah, it's not, can we skip that stuff? But it's, it's, it's not, it shouldn't catch us by surprise. Um, that scripture is not, um, baiting and switching us with this stuff. It, it's very honest about it. Yeah, absolutely. And remembering this world is broken, which means it's not our home, right? So the goal of life, and this is another thing Carter and I were talking about, the goal of this life is not how can I make myself comfortable and happy and protect myself? No, as, as a believer, as a Christian in following Christ, I actually do the opposite. And I put myself in places where it's not comfortable, where things are not secure because you know, Christ didn't have a place to lay his head. You know, he didn't have a home. He didn't have all these things. And so the goal of life is not happiness. I think that's another thing we were talking about was perception. I think sometimes when we have the perception that life is supposed to be good and is supposed to make me happy, and then those thing, hard things come, it's even more devastating. But when we know, just like what you're saying in scripture, we're bathed in scripture and we know hard times are going to come. That's part of this life it still sucks, but it doesn't feel quite as bait and switch maybe, yeah. or like I don't deserve this or this shouldn't be happening. It feels more of, well, yes, this is, this is it. This is part of, part of the journey, but yeah. I know God's going to do something with it. I'm kind of reminded of, um, so like with, with the questioning, I think, um, <clears throat> That we need to remember that it's like a it's a humble questioning, right? So it's a a hum humbly asking why, knowing that maybe you won't get the get an answer. But I think like with uh maybe like Habakkuk, we see that he wants to know, or he's not satisfied with what God is doing, and so he's like, well, I'm just gonna wait in my watchtower, and I'm just gonna sit there and and wait patiently for a better answer. So God gives him a different answer. He totally he peels back the curtain a little bit and gives him a little a little snippet of everything, and Habakkuk is like, oh wow, I totally missed it. I totally missed the point. And so what we, so we see this, like, yes, we can ask questions. And like with Job, Job is asking these questions. And yeah, he, he wants a response. Like we, we do want an answer to our questions, of course. It's absolutely, totally valid that we would want an answer. But maybe it's in adjusting our perception a little bit that maybe we find that, oh, the answer isn't everything. The answer isn't going to be everything that I need because maybe sometimes like I I feel like a lot of Christians sometimes when they when we address the topic of pain and suffering maybe we try to answer the questions too much and so maybe by answering questions we can cause more harm because we're focused on saying the exact right thing that somebody could need to hear so that all of their questions go away but I think the nature of questions is that when you get answers, you have more questions. Mm. And I think we need to learn to live with questions. I feel like that's a really like biteable little phrase that you just said. <laughs> <laughs> I spout off some wisdom every once <laughs> It's in like a little sound bite right afternoon. there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so thinking, of, thinking about the book of Job that we kind of surveyed on Sunday, um, the first three friends, they're convinced he must have done something wrong. Therefore God's punishing him. What we know as the readers as he, he's a righteous man. He hasn't done anything wrong. Um, in chapter 31, he's like, God, I've been defending myself. Could you defend yourself? Um, like, why don't you show up and explain what's going on? And then his fourth friend shows up and is like, Hey, you don't have any right to, to put God on trial. You don't, you shouldn't be doing this kind of chastises Job. 
And then he goes into a, a greater good explanation. And what's interesting is as you get to the end in chapter 42, God's like, and that guy was wrong. And, um, and so I look back at, um, I, I mentioned in the sermon that I wrote this, this paper on theodicy. And, and that's really where I landed was a greater good perspective on evil and thinking about Romans eight twenty three, man, like what a highlightable verse and underlining verse for me, a, a quoted, quoted verse to friends, quoted verse to me, but thinking about with our limited perception, um, from our horizon, what we've seen in our life experience for me, 38 years, like I don't see a lot of the world to understand the complexity of things. And, and what, what we see with God's response is that the friends have kind of oversimplified the answers. And I think that's where that one of the dangers is because mm-hmm. when people are asking the why questions, like you said, we have the temptation of like, man, we want to provide some type of answer. But the truth is, is oftentimes we can oversimplify it, which might cause more harm than good. And yeah. so Leah, 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 what would you say is um, if, if not providing or trying to answer the question is, isn't the first or best response. Like what are, what are, what are some other responses yeah. that you would say are helpful or, or maybe think, more needed? Yeah. I think we kind of talked about this a little bit in episode one, when we were talking about like the, the thing behind the question, the person behind the question. And, um, I mean, presence is so important and tangible acts of love are so important um, seeing, seeing people's pain, um, and people knowing that they don't have to weep alone. Like that's what the church exists for is so that we mourn with people that are mourning and weep with people who are weeping. Um, and you don't have to go off in a corner and, and do that by yourself and come back to the space when you're all better, but rather, um, that this is a space where we can do that together. Um, and I think reclaiming a lot of those kinds of practices and, and practicing that kind of presence with people, um, it makes, because our culture, right, says like suffering is not the norm, like being happy and being content or satisfied is the norm or, or seeking satisfaction is the norm. And if you're suffering, that's, you know, not the norm. But if we kind of shift that paradigm that no, 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 actually suffering is, is a very real thing in this life. And it's going to, it's going to come in some form or fashion. And for all of us, um, and, and creating a space and a presence for people that like when the storm hits, you're not by yourself and you're not alone in that. And it's not that we're going to comfort you with answers, but we're going to comfort you with presence. Um, yeah. so you don't have to walk through it alone. I think that that's huge. And so for some, if you're listening and, and you're like me, um, my first response is to, to fix it. And it's interesting. We go into more detail about this, but talking about, um, just your upbringing, your, your nature versus your nurture for me, like as a, a latchkey kid, I learned from a very early age, if I want a snack, make macaroni and cheese. If I want this, like there's a problem, you got to figure out how to fix it. And so that's carried into my adulthood, into my life. And so when I hear a problem, my natural response is how can I fix it? And so I start thinking through solutions. And so if I hear a, sure. why, if I hear a why question and my bent is towards um, a greater good, Yeah, I'm trying to like play out in my mind, like how could this become a greater good? And I'm going to help them connect the dots. And the truth is that that's not, they don't need the dots connected. If God gifts them those those dots being connected later in life, they can look back at it. Awesome. It's not my job or the job of the presence to be the dot connector. And um, yeah. so, so I, think, I was also a latchkey kid. So I totally resonate with all of those things. Slash, I was also the boss of my younger siblings to make sure. Yeah, I was the youngest. <laughs> I was fixing, so. <laughs> fixing their problems too. I, I think it, if I can pause it, like you shift, shifting the perspective of the way to fix the problem is to just sit with them. And not to have an answer that fixes the problem, but rather my presence as their friend, as their pastor, as their shepherd helps fix the problem. Maybe not here in this moment, but over the course of time yeah. helps the healing process take hold, take root. Um, so they're not in that same place in a year. Yeah. So Carter, what about you? So uh, you I know you want to reframe the question to like, how's God refining you? And that could read wrong. That could just be like another way of saying a greater good. Yeah. And so how would you say if, if, 
how would you say what's a better response than trying to provide an answer other than is there anything you'd add to practicing presence? Is there another, another component that could be helpful? Yeah. Um, I, I think it could be really good for somebody to recognize that, you know, we've been invited into the work, like God's work of redemption. Like mm-hmm. we are taking part in his like salvation for the world. And so, you know, remembering that salvation like the root of it is healing. So yep. as we're creating these spaces for people to sit and to weep, gnash their teeth, whatever they need to do to, to like get their, like connect with their emotions and, and just be for a second, be real, be totally authentic. I think as we create those spaces, we maybe like take part in a fuller picture of what it means to take part of like, take part in that mm-hmm. saving work. Yeah. Because it's healing. It's healing for somebody to let their emotions out. I mean, we have so many artists in, you know, creating music or creating paintings or all these things like poetry. And the whole point is to get these emotions out that just regular words can't express. And so we need to create spaces for people to do that. And I I feel like that's the biggest thing and I think that's probably like Mm. the biggest step we could take yeah and then maybe we can talk about how we can walk people through the process later sure but I think the biggest first step is just creating a space for somebody because that's what they need they need presence they they need to feel somebody going through them because God is God is right here with us he is with you moving I mean we look at we look back at the prophets again and we look at Ezekiel and Ezekiel talks about how like his vision is of the glory of God, but the the glory of God is on wheels and it's moving. You know, the, the Jews had been removed from Israel and they've been moved East to Babylon. And so they feel like, well, a totally logical conclusion for them would be, Oh, well, my God is trapped in the rubble of the temple because that's where the presence of God was. But now we see with Ezekiel that God is moving to Babylon with his people. He is with his people. And he comes back with them whenever they go back to Jerusalem to rebuild. So he's here in the same way. He is here with us and he is suffering with us. He weeps with us because he loves us so much. Yeah. And that's, I think, something I take comfort in is, um, is knowing that Christ has suffered um, you know, thinking about him in the garden to the point where he is sweating blood, knowing what's coming with the cross. And so as we suffer in this world, we don't say it as a, oh, well, I'm not suffering in the same way as Christ, but, it, but knowing like, but he knows what it feels like to suffer because he's gone, he's done it too. He's gone through it. With, he's gone through it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Carter, when you were talking, the only thing I could think of is, how many times when we are maybe talking about some of our emotions with someone, do we apologize mm. for feeling something? Have you guys ever done that? Like you're, yeah. you're talking and then you're like, I'm so sorry. Like that, I had that experience last night. Somebody was sharing something and they're like, I'm so sorry. And I was like, don't, don't apologize. Like it's, it, it's an okay to have emotion. And so realizing how deep that runs too, that we almost feel like we have to apologize for expressing how we're feeling. Yeah. And I think that Carter and I were talking about that a little bit before, and um, it reminded me of, of listening to, um, there was a psychologist being interviewed by, I think, Carrie Newhoff or somebody. And, mm-hmm. and um, he's talking about every loss deserves a, a proper amount of, of, um, of mourning. Yeah. And so, like, you know, if, if you lose your favorite pen, like, there's a proper amount of mourning for that. It might be like you're sad for half a day because, like, you really love that pen, but you're not going on weeks. But, um, Hopefully not. But, like, losing a parent totally yeah. different perspective. And I think that, that emotional space to, to say like, no, I'm hurting and to be able to, to express that and to put language to it. If you can find the language is part of the healing process. If you, if you push it down, you might fool yourself into thinking you're dealing with it or you're, you're moving on, but it's kind of like holding a beach ball into the water. Eventually yeah. you can't hold it any longer and it explodes into extremes. And so taking time to, to process emotions, is huge in the, in the midst of, of pain and suffering. Yeah. And I would say like, absolutely. We need that as individuals, but right now we need it collectively as a society. Um, 
I, I heard it said, and I, I can't remember who the person was, but that we're living through the traumatic age right now. And, and yes, COVID, but also just the way that media is influencing our lives and is warping and changing things. And so um, more than ever, the church needs to, we've always needed to be the healing force, right, for the world. But more than ever, we need to be a healing force for the world and opening up a space that says, hey, what we have here, Christ is going to, he can heal it. He can heal you. Um, Because that is something that you can't find anywhere else. Yeah. I'm backtracking a little bit. I was thinking about Carter talking about just the, the presence of God. I think it's huge to know that God's with us in our pain, but I, I can also hear the person saying, it doesn't feel like God's with me. Like sure. I don't feel God's presence. And sure. so, um, and as you're talking about the suffering of Christ, I've been reminded in this particular season of just the gift of communion every week and, um, and needing that reminder that Christ is with me. And so I, I so once again, for, for those listening, if you take communion on a, on a regular basis, we do it every week at Redeemer. Don't let it just be a white noise experience or just um, going through the motions like vain repetition. I think really reflecting on the suffering of Christ and remembering the, the physicality of that is to remind us of the presence of Christ with us. And so sometimes it's a fight to feel that presence, but I think I found that to be a helpful reminder. And, and I would say that it's you know, obviously as a Protestant, different than Catholic, as far as my view of, of the Eucharist, but sure. I still think there's a, a, a much more spiritual component happening than maybe my, my Protestant self allows to, or yeah. I, I in the past realized was going on. Sure. Sure. And I, I love that you said you brought Christ suffering into it because, you know, the moment on the cross when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Like he feels God's presence, leave him. Right. So when we feel like God is not with us, even if we intellectually know it, we can still resonate with a savior who felt that too. Yeah, that's a good word. Well, and you know, looking at grief culture in like Eastern cultures, like we have this image of like tearing your clothes or like rending your clothes. And it's this, you know, this very vivid image of somebody ripping their shirt or they're like their attire, like they're ripping it from top to bottom, right? And we see the same thing with the veil in the temple, right? You know, like Christ is on the cross and then he dies and the, te- and the veil in the temple rips from top to bottom. And it's this awful sound of ripping fabric that you hear, but it's God tearing his clothes, right? It's rending the fabric because he feels the grief and the pain of losing his son so just as much as we feel our grief and our pain god does too christ does and we have examples of it and so the bible reminds us of this and so i I think there's like there can be this disconnect because we feel like well to be quite honest i mean like the enemy whispers in our ear oh god doesn't really care about you he doesn't really care about what's going on he he's too big for that you shouldn't bring this little petty thing to him because you're just being petty for for lack of a better word, I guess, on my part. But we see time and time again in the Bible that that is not the case, that God does genuinely care for every single person on the face of this planet, and he loves us so deeply, and he grieves with us mm-hmm. because he grieves too for things. Yeah. Well, um, one last question that I'd love to get to is just something that, that I'm trying to put my finger on and to see if you guys have any thoughts on it is some people will go through the hardest times and they will, they'll be stronger in their faith than ever. And you'll see them drawing near to God and, and worshiping. And then you'll see other people go through stuff and, and they just, they're like, I'm done with this. I'm out. And, um, why do you guys think that there's such, such different responses? Um, maybe same circumstances, but different sure. people and different responses. Even, even kids. You'll see mm-hmm. something tragic happen in a family. One kid will draw close and one kid will pull away. Sure, sure. Carter, you want to take a stab at it first? Oh, man. Um, I just feel like p- 
people experience things in so many different ways. And we just really have no idea what, what else is also going on. So like they're going through the same exact experience. But I, I think like a lot of what goes into a response for somebody is also what has gone on before. And so maybe it's this, you know, this utter desperation or this utter desolation that you feel as you're going through a trial because you just feel like you've been hammered over and over and over again. And I, I don't know that I can give an answer to that. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like, and not, not to say this in like a prideful or boastful way, I just don't feel like I've been beaten down that way. And so maybe I'm not the, the best qualified person to answer that kind of a question, but I, like I hope that people know that God is with you. He, he cares for you and he wants you to feel his presence around you. And I would hope that um, the person that does feel like I, I'm, I'm done, that their community would still say, okay, but we're, but we're not done with you. We're still your community. We're still your friends. We're still your family. And so even though you are in this space right now, um, again, you don't have to go outside the circle to figure things out. You can stay here and we're going to love you. And we're going to take care of you. Um, I was thinking, Jeff, when you were talking about that, I was thinking about um, the soils, Jesus' parable about the soils, um, kind of like in reference to how our heart accepts things. And um, shout out to Bema, Marty Solomon. You can put that in the show notes. <laughs> I can't remember what episode it is, but he says something in the teaching that um, perhaps we all at different times, our heart is all of those different types of soil. And so I guess the hope for me would be that that person that's saying I'm done would one day say, I'm ready to come back in. I'm ready to not be done anymore. Um, I don't know if that answers your yeah. question. No, I think it's important to know for, because uh, this isn't just theoretical stuff. The one uh, people listening are either in this because they're experiencing the job or they're the friends in the family, like his wife or like the friends sitting with him. And so when we think about how do we deal with it, if we're the friends or the family yeah. and someone we love is, is saying it's suffering, I'm, yeah, I, I don't know what to do with this. And I, I don't know if I can worship a God. I'm not about to fake it. I, I'm just kind of, I'm done yeah. to, to know that their story is not done. Yeah. Their story is not done. Yeah, and, God's, and, uh, and I think, cause you're talking about that, that community sticking by their side. I was just yeah. reminded of the love of God, you know, yeah. like that, that has said that, I, my, God is faithful despite our faithlessness yeah, right. um, that we have the chance to show that by saying, Hey, I know you're in a hard place, but we're not going anywhere. Yeah, and, um, and nothing can separate us from the love of God, right? Yeah. Like nothing. Um, and then if you are friends or family and you're um, walking through this with somebody, I would say one, because I'm saying this to myself too, you're not God. You're not in control. It's not your job to fix as we've already I think kind of alluded to, um, be a good friend, be a good daughter, mother, son, cousin, uncle, whatever the relationship is, and trust that just by being there, that you are, you're being Christ's hands and feet to that person. Yeah. Nice. And it's again, not our job to, can, to make an outcome happen because then that's just manipulative and coercive. Yeah. Well, I know, I know you spent a lot of time reading and studying and, and doing your homework on this. So is there any, anything else you want to get out before we call it quits? I have a really good quote. Love. If you're okay. I did spend some time reading some things last night. Yeah. Um, this is from, um, Walter Brueggemann. He says, hope is subversive precisely because it dares to admit that all is not as it should be. And so we're holding out for, working for, creating, prophesying, and living into something better for the kingdom to come, for oaks of righteousness to tower, for leaves to blossom, for the healing of the nations, for swords to be beaten to plowshares, for joy to come in the morning, and for redemption and justice to rule. That's good. Carter, what about you? Any, any concluding thoughts? 
I don't think so. I think I've said just about everything I could probably think of. Yeah, love it. <laughs> yeah, well, one last thing that got cut um, from the sermon, and I say this with um, a disclaimer because I don't think that God throws verses at things to try to explain it away. Um, but something that I've found personally comforting in my own life through um, through seasons of, of hard times, through through pain, through suffering, has been Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3. And it begins with David just crying out in a miry bog, and he, he acknowledges that God hears him. And so for me, that's always been a reminder that when I'm crying out to God, I know that he hears me. And, um, and we don't know how long that season was, if it was a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, years, but he was in a season that felt like a miry bog. And he says that God in time put his feet on the solid rock and to know that there, there was a time of deliverance and, um, and to know like in God's timing, um, that's what we got to trust in. But the, the thing that's been so huge for me on that is that at the end, it, it says that he'll put a new song, mm-hmm. um, And I love that because I think about in our culture right now, how many songs have been written and to think through that, that what would it be like to, to go through something and to see God from a new angle that no song written can capture and to say, I have to write a new song from what I know of God's goodness now. And so, um, so I just know that's, so for it's worth, that's been something I've held on to. That's been helpful for me. It's a, it's a text I often come back to and, um, and God has used it mightily in my own life so well that is our first four episodes um for quietly questioning we probably have some bonus episodes going into the summer um before we hit the summer for our our series on abundant life but um stay tuned for for future episodes that are around the corner